Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Hardy, Editorial Director and Associate Publisher of LightWave. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's LightWave webcast, in which we'll discuss the what, how, and why of 800G Generation Optical Engine Performance. Our webinar today is sponsored by Infinera, whom we thank for their help in making today's event possible. So, of course, coherent 800 gig technology is starting to gain traction in carrier networks around the world. Uh, needless to say, achieving such transmission rates requires a significant amount of uh, technical advances, not only to just produce the signals themselves, but to do so in a way that uh, enables network operators to deploy 800G capabilities without having to totally re-architect their infrastructures. Uh, today, we thought it would be interesting to take a peek behind the technology curtain, so to speak, and review some of the issues that had to be addressed to make 800G transmission reality and how technology developers manage to overcome them. And to help us achieve those goals today, we have Paul Montahan, Solution Marketing Director at Infinera. Among other things, Paul will describe some of the major optical performance parameters uh, that apply to uh, this scenario, uh, the relationship between capacity and reach, and uh, what uh, technology approaches can make that relationship a happy one. Uh, before I hand things off to Paul, let me quickly review our webcast setup for those of you who are joining us for the first time or the first time in a long time. I'll start with the ask a question box that you should see near the slide area. I invite you to feel free to use this to ask questions uh, at any time during the event today. To submit a question, just click in that box, type in your question, and hit the send button. Paul will address your questions after he's finished his presentation, so at the, uh, the end of the event. Now, in the uh, event you run into a technical problem during the presentation, you can call for help using the Q&A tool as well. Just describe your problem, hit the send button, and Shannon, who is today's webcast technician, will be happy to help you out. Next, if you know of someone who might benefit from seeing this webcast as well, or you just want to revisit the presentation yourself, the event will be available on demand from our webcast archive for the next several months. We'll send you an email with a link to the archives sometime in the next day or so. You should feel free to pass that around to your coworkers. Uh, the archive version of the webcast also will be accessible from the LightWave website at www.lightwaveonline.com. Just look for the word webcast from the main navigation bar. Click on that. Find this webcast uh, at the top of the list of webcasts you'll be presented with. Click on the title and then click either on the register button or the view webcast button and you'll be in. Now, if you'd like, you'll be able to download copies of today's slides. You can find those behind the uh, event resources tab that you should see on your screens right below the ask a question box. Just click the tab to reveal the files. While you're there, you'll want to download the white papers related to today's topic that Infinera has provided for further reading. Finally, if you'd like a certificate of attendance, perhaps for continuing education purposes, hang on until the end of the event, and I'll let you know how to get your hands on one. And with that, let's begin. As I mentioned, Paul is a Solution Marketing Director at Infinera, focusing on next generation optical technology, including Infinera's 800G per wavelength i6 optical engine. Prior to this, Paul held several technical sales, product line management, and marketing roles at Corient and before that, Tel Labs, covering uh, various times Metro and long haul packet optical, IPMPLS routing, and mobile backhaul. Before that, Paul held product management and marketing positions at UK Ethernet service provider Neos Networks, ATM specialist for systems, and LAN specialist MAG Networks. Paul has engineering and management degrees from Cambridge University in the UK and Stanford University in the US. Paul, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Stephen. Okay, so in terms of an agenda, um, I'm going to talk today about the what optical performance is. Uh, we're going to define optical performance as very, various different metrics uh, for optical performance, so we'll take a look at those. Uh, and for each of those metrics, we'll discuss why it matters, uh, uh, how it helps you to save cost, to reduce power consumption, uh, and so on. Uh, then we'll take a look at how co coherent technology uh, is evolving, some of the enablers for that evolution, uh, and then uh, what embedded optical engines, as opposed to pluggables, uh, how they're prioritizing the, uh, the specific uh, vectors of that evolution. 
Um, uh, then we'll look at uh, how you get the maximum wavelength capacity reach, uh, both at 800 gig uh, at data rates uh, and at lower data rates. And that really boils down to three things, the board rate, uh, the modem SNR, which I'll uh, explain, uh, and some innovative features. Uh, and then we'll kind of wrap up uh, by looking at what performance you 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 can expect to get from Infinera's i6 800 gig uh, generation optical engine. Uh, you know what it can deliver and what are some of the factors that uh, uh, influence uh, the actual performance that you'll see in a real network. Okay, so let's talk about optical performance. Uh, now, the most obvious uh, metric that you hear uh, most used as uh, when we talk about 800 gig generation performance is the wavelength capacity reach. Uh, so uh, for a particular wavelength of a particular data rate, how far can it go? Or, or to put it another way, if we have a particular reach requirement, uh, what speed can we run that wavelength at? Uh, so this is really about the distance uh, uh, and the data rate. Um, so that we're typically talking a couple of hundred kilometers in the metro, uh, the 600 kilometers for, for regional, and then long haul can be up to maybe 7,000 kilometers and even, even longer for subsea. Uh, and as we get better wavelength capacity reach, that helps us drive down the cost per bit. Uh, it helps us dra drive down the uh, power consumption per bit uh, uh, and the footprint. Uh, so it has a lot of benefits. The other benefit is, is that if we have a, 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 a high speed wavelength, uh, that means we need fewer wavelengths and that simplifies operations in terms of things like planning and installation uh, and, and uh, uh, configuring that wavelength. Now, wavelength capacity reach is one metric, but it, it's not the only metric. Uh, another metric that is particularly important in metro regional networks uh, is Rodom Cascade. Uh, and this is how many Rodoms you can pass through uh, before you degrade the signal. Uh, as you pass through a Rodom, you, you, um, you have a loss inside the Rodom with the splitter and, and WSS, or WSS is if it's uh, route and select, that you have to compensate uh, with amplification that adds noise. You also have filter narrowing, uh, and, and in some types of rodents, you can also get some leakage of non-selected channels that, that causes some crosstalk. Uh, so, uh, so, so going through rodents can reduce the the reach of the wavelength uh, um, uh, more than the distance. Uh, and for metro regional networks, that 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 can be more important. What we typically see in a North American network is uh, we typically see kind of for the 95th percentile about uh, eight spans uh, and very occasionally up to maybe 13, 15 spans. In, in Europe, the metros tend to be a little bit smaller. So maybe the 95th percentile is, is six spans uh, and the 99th percentile is, is nine spans. Uh, and when we have good road and cascade tolerance, that really simplifies metro planning and installation. We don't have to worry about regens uh, or, or whether we can take a wavelength uh, through the metro over a certain number of uh, rodent cascades. So that's a, that's a second metric. Then uh, a third metric for optical performance is spectral efficiency and its, uh, uh, and its close friend uh, fiber capacity. So with wavelength capacity reach, what we're trying to do is get the most capacity uh, out of a, a coherent transceiver uh, and that's um, that's going to drive down our, our cost, power, and, and space, as I mentioned. Uh, but spectral efficiency is slightly different. Uh, with spectral efficiency, you're trying to get the most bits per second out of each hertz of spectrum. Uh, so you can have high spectral efficiency and low wavelength capacity, or, or, or vice versa. Uh, they, they, they quite often move moving in concert. Uh, so spectral efficiency is the bits per second per hertz uh, for a given reach, uh, and that's the one that's subject to the Shannon limit uh, that limits, uh, uh, you can't get better spectral efficiency than the Shannon limit. Uh, and then fiber capacity is taking spectral efficiency and then adding in the amount of spectrum. So we can increase the spectrum with uh, extended C band or super C uh, or the C plus L, uh, then that impacts fiber capacity. Um, and basically, better spectral efficiency and fiber capacity, the real benefit is it avoids the high cost uh, and the long uh, time to acquire and light new fiber. Uh, 
Uh, and that, that could be one of the most expensive parts of running an optical network. So uh, the, for a lot of networks, if we can get more out of our existing fiber, uh, that has a very big economic benefit. Um, a couple of other performance parameters. Uh, so for aerial fiber, uh, SOP, state of polarization tolerance, uh, or, or put another way, lightning tolerance uh, can be important. Um, and that's about the number of uh, uh, rads per second of, uh, of polarization. Uh, um, so uh, the, the kind of average, uh, the 50% mark is, is 400k rads per second. The top 1% is 2 million rads per second uh, or higher. Uh, so uh, it, it, we, particularly where you have aerial, aerial fiber, uh, lightning tolerance uh, can be important. <coughs> Uh, the transmit power can also be important in, in certain scenarios. So um, if we want to be compatible with a particular rotor, you may need a certain transmit power, uh, or if you want to uh, uh, get a certain reach without amplifiers, then you need a certain transmit power. Uh, Out-of-band noise, which I'll talk a little bit in more detail about later, uh, is also uh, important. Uh, the, the transceivers transmit noise not just within the spectrum of the wavelength, but outside of that. Uh, and if you don't have good mitigation techniques, that can cause you problems, particularly uh, if you want to do colorless ad drop. And then uh, for subsea, what we see is the, the you know, headline Data rates uh, and spectral efficiency is important, but what we also need to do is, is uh, the, the, the fiber has different uh, penalties at uh, uh, different parts of the spectrum. So we need the flexibility to be able to adjust the board rate uh, and the modulation for each part of the spectrum to get the most out of the uh, subsea fibers. And then uh, in terms of those optical performance characteristics, uh, what, what, you, what you tend to see is different characteristics uh, are important for, or, or more important for different applications. So for point-to-point -point Metro DCI, uh, the most important is, is typically wavelength capacity reach. Uh, for Metro, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Rodom Cascade uh, is a key metric. Uh, long haul is typically a balance between the wavelength capacity reach uh, and the spectral efficiency. And then subsea, given the uh, high cost of those uh, subsea fibers, uh, spectral efficiency and fiber capacity tend to be the, the most important. Uh, wavelength capacity reach uh, it, it can also be important. And there are other uh, <coughs> parameters uh, uh, that, that can be important on a kind of case-by-case -case basis. <clears throat> okay, so let's look a little bit now at how uh, coherent technology uh, is evolving. Uh, so if we look inside a coherent optical engine, we kind of really see three main bits. Uh, we see the digital ASIC, commonly referred to uh, as the DSP, even though that's just one of the functions uh, a modern digital ASIC will, will contain, uh, also provides the uh, ACD, the DAC, uh, and the ADC. Uh, so, that's, so that's the analog ASIC that's, uh, with, with the DSP. Then you have the uh, photonics, which is things like the modulator um, that, that modulates the light uh, and the laser. Uh, you have the photo detectors uh, and, and various other bits of uh, uh, passive uh, optics. And then in between those two, you have the analog electronics, uh, the, the driver uh, and the TIA. Uh, so the driver uh, 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 takes the, the voltage from the ASIC and makes it suitable for the photonics, uh, and the TIA takes the current from the, uh, from the photo detectors uh, and converts it to a voltage that the, that the uh, digital ASIC can understand. So um, if, we, if we look at that, then, then one of the key drivers is the digital ASIC. Um, and really what's been driving the evolution of the digital ASIC is, is the CMOS process node evolution. Uh, so we've gone from 65 nanometer to 40 nanometer, 40 to uh, 28, 28 to 16 nanometer, and now we're on seven nanometer uh, with five nanometer uh, coming up soon. Uh, and uh, each, of, each time we, we, we make that jump between process nodes, 
uh, we get better performance, uh, we get uh, reduced power consumption, and we shrink the area for, uh, for um, relatively speaking. Uh, and what that's enabled us to do is uh, evolve the digital ASIC, and you can see here the, the Infinera digital ASICs um, and how we've gone from tens of uh, millions of, of transistors uh, with our first digital ASIC to hundreds of millions, uh, then to 1.6 billion with our ICE-4, our 600 gig CHM2T in the groove has about 2.5 billion, and now with I6, we have uh, 5 billion transistors. And more transistors basically means we have more processing power, so we can do uh, more advanced uh, optical functions, uh, features like Nyquist subcarriers, um, probabilistic constellation shaping, uh, and higher board rates, uh, and things like 64 QAM. So what, what you see is a, a very high correlation between the CMOS process node uh, and the coherent technology. So we've gone from uh, uh, from uh, HDFAC to SDFAC at both at 100 gig, then came the 200 gig uh, and 400 gig, then 600 gig uh, and now 800 gig. Uh, and that correlates uh, uh, very closely with the evolution in the CMOS process node. The, uh, as I mentioned, the other uh, key component uh, of the um, optical engine is the photonics, uh, and there the evolution has been to uh, photonic integration, and that's taking more and more optical functions and putting them onto a single photonic integrated circuit. Uh, so taking things like the modulator, the laser, um, the photodetectors, uh, all the functions I mentioned uh, uh, previously, and putting them onto, uh, onto a PIC, putting the, both the transceive and the receive onto the same pick and even putting multiple wavelengths onto the same pick. And there are two primary uh, technology platforms for doing that. One is indium phosphide and the other is silicon photonics. And they, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, for indium phosphide, uh, the, one of the key benefits is you can integrate the gain elements like the laser and the amplifier. Um, you also have better uh, modulator performance because indium phosphide has a, a kind of superior optoelectric effect. Uh, but the downside with indium phosphide is you, you need to have a, a, an indium phosphide fab, so you, you, you have to in, in invest in that. Uh, with silicon photonics, the downside is you, you, you're going to need an, uh, an external indium phosphide laser, uh, and you're probably going to need uh, external um, amplifiers if you want to have higher power. Um, the advantage is, is that you can leverage legacy CMOS fabs. So if you don't have a fab, you can use a, an older CMOS process node fab, um, somewhere in the kind of 130 to 45 nanometer range. Uh, so, so that can be an advantage. Uh, and if you want to uh, hear about that, there's uh, uh, in terms of the indium phosphide and the case for indium phosphide for high-performance optical engines like I6, there's an Infinera uh, white paper that gives uh, uh, some more detail. Okay, so um, so we've talked about how the photonic uh, and CMOS technology is evolving, uh, but in particular with the CMOS technology, uh, as it evolves and we can get more transistors into a, a into a given space. Um, and get more processing power for the uh, for a given amount of watts. Uh, we have really three ways we can use that. Uh, one way is we can build the highest performance uh, uh, DSP. Uh, if we want to maximize capacity reach and spectral efficiency, uh, we can we can use that DSP to do advanced functions that are processor intensive, like Nyquist subcarriers and probabilistic constellation shaping, and do very advanced forward error correction. Uh, as well as have very high board rates. So that's a performance uh, uh, vector. Uh, what we can also do is we could build a smaller, lower power DSP uh, to minimize space and power uh, and to enable coherent pluggables. And that's what you see with things like 400ZR, ZR plus, uh, and XR optics. And then the other thing we can do is, uh, as we have more processing power uh, in, in the ASIC, uh, rather than use that processing power for optical functions, we can use it for systems level functions, functions that previously would have lived on the card, the exponder, 
um, or uh, in the shelf controller, um, uh, things like uh, uh, remote management, encryption, demarcation, uh, some packet OTN functionality, we can integrate that into the digital ASIC. Um, And if you want more details, there's a new uh, Infinera uh, white paper that goes into a lot of detail on the, this evolution uh, and these three vectors and how pluggables uh, and embedded optical engines prioritize these vectors differently. So when we're making these prioritizations, uh, one of the things that matters is the size of the optical engine. Uh, so pluggables are great, uh, but you're somewhat constrained by size. Uh, one area in which that manifests itself is the size of the DSP. So if you look at a 400 gig pluggable, uh, you've typically got about 1.5 billion transistors. Uh, if you look at the i6 DSP, you've got more than 5 billion transistors. So that's kind of one point of difference between a pluggable uh, and an embedded is that you can build a, a more a larger uh, DSP with more processing power, though it, it's also more power hungry. Uh, another difference is, uh, is with the form factor, and this isn't to do with the DSP, uh, but if you take a QSFPDD, which is a small uh, form factor uh, pluggable, uh, you've got the DSP and you've got the analog photonics, uh, but you don't have room for any extra amplification. Uh, so particularly if that, if that photonics is with silicon photonics, uh, then you typically get a low uh, output power, uh, around about minus 10 dBm. Um, the other thing that you don't have room for is a tunable optical filter, and, and that means you have high out-of-band noise. And we'll talk about why that's important uh, in the next slide. Uh, if you have a CFP2, then you have room for a little micro EDFA, uh, and that can uh, boost the power. So you typically see kind of somewhere in the kind of minus 5 to 0 dBm for CFP2s. And then in something like the um, uh, in I6, uh, we have both the amplifiers in the, in the photonics, and we can also have extra uh, micro amplifiers, uh, and that enables us to have much higher uh, transmit power, uh, minus sorry, plus nine dBm in the I6 case. Um, so those those are some of the uh, benefits that you get from having a, a larger optical engine. Uh, so just to explain in a little more detail the tunable optical filter, uh, as I explained previously, when you uh, have an optical uh, transmitter, uh, you, you, you uh, have both the, uh, the wavelength itself, but you also generate some noise. And that noise either comes from amplification or it can come from laser side modes. Uh, so you're sending the noise both within the spectrum of the wavelength and noise outside the spectrum of the wavelength. Where this can become a challenge is if you're using something like a combiner to do colorless filterless add drop, uh, when you add those wavelengths together, the noise of each uh, optical engine adds together. So you can end up with a lot of noise. Uh, with a tunable optical filter, uh, you're only sending the noise uh, that's within the spectrum of the wavelength. You're, you're blocking all the noise outside that, that spectrum. So when you add uh, the three wavelengths together, as, as shown underneath, they're only uh, sending their own noise. So the noise doesn't interfere with the other wavelengths. It doesn't start to accumulate from the different uh, uh, transceivers. So this lack of a tunable optical filter in a, in, in, say, a smaller form factor like a QSF PDD can make out of band noise uh, <coughs> performance challenging. And this can make it difficult to do colorless add drop. Okay, so uh, in terms of these three vectors, what we're trying to do with I6 is really prioritize that uh, performance vector, that central performance vector, uh, with 96 gig gigaboard, high modem SNR, uh, advanced features like long code word PCS, Nyquist subcarriers, dynamic bandwidth allocation. There's a, there's a long list, uh, but the, the real priority is on, on maximizing the performance. Uh, in terms of space and power, uh, we do have uh, good space and power. Um, if you do a side-by-side -side comparison with a 400 gig pluggable, the power is going to sound higher. Uh, but really where the, the benefit comes is, is at longer distances. If you look at the, 
the power, uh, the, the watts per gig per kilometre, uh, then that's where you get the benefit from, a, from a, uh, an embedded uh, engine like i6. And then we're also integrating some systems level functionality like encryption, uh, but we're, we're, we, the, we're not trying, that's not the main focus for uh, an embedded engine like i6. The focus is, is definitely on the maximizing performance. Whereas with uh, uh, pluggables, you're, you're, you're more prioritizing the space and power vector. In some cases, you're bringing some advanced features optical features uh, into the uh, pluggable, for example, with XR optics, they have Nyquist subcarriers. Uh, and with XR optics, we also integrate a lot of systems level functionality so that we can provide a pluggable that really acts as a virtual transponder. Okay, so let's move on now to the uh, to how we get the performance, uh, how we get the maximum wavelength capacity reach. Uh, and this really boils down to three things. It boils down to the um, uh, to the ultra high uh, board rates. Uh, it boils down to the high modem SNR. That means keeping the noise low and distortions low inside the optical engine. Uh, and it boils down to some innovative features. Uh, and there's actually a, a white paper, one of the white papers you can download, uh, explains this in, in quite a bit of detail. So if, uh, if I get it, if I go a little bit too quick for anybody or they want more detail, that's one source to, uh, to, to get some more information. Okay, so let's start with the board rates. Uh, and board rates, high, increasing the board rate is always a good thing in terms of wavelength capacity reach. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The first is for the same data rate, uh, if we turn up the board rate, it means we don't need so many bits per symbol from the modulation, so we can use lower order modulation. With lower order modulation, the constellation points are further apart, so we're uh, less sensitive to noise. Uh, so kind of as a rule of thumb, every time we reduce the number of bits per symbol uh, polarization by one, uh, we double the reach. So if we go from 16 quam to 8 quam, we, 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 we double the reach. Um, now, the other thing about uh, the board rate is, and this has both a, a positive and a negative, is when we increase the board rate, we also increase the spectrum. So when we double the board rate, we double the amount of spectrum that wavelength consumes. And that's a, that's a not a great thing from a spectral efficiency perspective, because it means the board rate can't help us uh, to improve the spectral efficiency. But what it does help us with is nonlinearities, uh, because it means we can transmit the wavelength of much higher power without generating more uh, nonlinearities, which are proportional to the power spectral density. So when you put those two things together, um, it, it, uh, you also have to reduce a little bit because uh, you, you, you get a reduced reach a little bit from the higher board rate in itself, uh, which is, is more sensitive to noise and nonlinearities. But when you put those together, you're almost able to double the, uh, not quite, but almost able to double the reach uh, when you double the board rate uh, for the same data rate. So, so board rates are, are great. Uh, and again, uh, there's an Infinera white paper that explains uh, board rates in, in quite a bit of detail. Now, one of the surprising things with I6 is you get a very magnified effect uh, uh, at the very high data rate. So at 800 gig, if we take the, the minimum board rate uh, for 800 gig uh, with the full 64 QAM, which is around about just under uh, 84 gigaboard, um, if we increase that board rate by 50%, around about 96 gigaboard, then we can quadruple the reach. We can have 300% of the reach just by increasing the board rate by 15%, which is a really surprising result. And the reason for that is, is that uh, with 64 QAM, you're very, very sensitive to, uh, to noise. Uh, and if you can use probabilistic constellation shaping to, to get away from 64 QAM, to reduce the number of bits per symbol, uh, uh, and also to get to get the gain from probabilistic constellation shaping, uh, then it has a very magnified effect. We're able to go a lot further if we can increase the board rate beyond that uh, uh, minimum for 64 QAM. What we see at 600 gig and 400 gig is you get a much smaller uh, gain from that 15% increase in the board rate. Uh, and that's uh, down to two things. It's down to the fact that the uh, absolute 
uh, decrease in the number of uh, bits per symbol is, is lower. Uh, and it's also uh, because we're already gaining from got the PCS gain, which you don't get at the full 64 gram. So, um, you know, bottom line, at, at 800 gig, uh, a small increase in the uh, board rate can give you a, a huge increase in the reach. While at lower data rates, the benefit is smaller, but it's still valuable. <coughs> so a 40% and 20% increase uh, in, in the reach is still very worth having. Okay, let's look at the next factor now, and that's the uh, the modem SNR. And the modem SNR is, is basically the amount of noise that you that you generate inside the optical engine, uh, and you want that noise to be low, and therefore the modem SNR to be high. Um, and the way you get that is by having very high performance components, the uh, the ASIC. Uh, DSP, you need very good performance. The analog ASIC is very is very uh, critical, uh, and and the photonics they all uh, are very important to get um, to minimize that amount of noise and distortion, particularly at these high uh, data rates inside the optical engine. What you also need is you need to design these things to work together. Uh, so you need to co-design them. So you don't design the ASIC independently from the analog ASIC independently from the photonics, you kind of design them all to work together. You decide which of those components you put various uh, uh, functions in. Uh, you also need a very good RF interconnect. Uh, how you design that is very important, the RF interconnect in particular between the, uh, the DSP and the analog ASIC uh, and how you package it together. So bottom line, uh, uh, the noise sensitivity you have at 800 gig makes high modem SNR critical, uh, and high modem SNR requires deep vertical integration. So it really helps if you if you do all of this stuff uh, in house if you want to get really good performance at 800 gig. Okay, let's look now at features, uh, and one of those is is Nyquist subcarriers. And this is a feature that we pioneered with our I4 uh, optical engine. And, and so with I6, we're now moving on to our second generation Nyquist subcarriers. Sub so with a conventional uh, carrier, uh, you have uh, uh, you have a single you have a single carrier running at 96 gigaboard, let's say. Um, and the problem you have is there's a squared relationship between the board rate and the chromatic dispersion. Um, so, uh, you know, as you as you double the board rate, you the effect of the chromatic dispersion increases by a factor of four, and so on. Uh, so, chromatic dispersion can be a big problem with very high board rates. It's one of the other downsides of very high board rates is, is the chromatic dispersion. Uh, and maybe you've got a very good DSP, and you can compensate for that chromatic dispersion. Uh, the problem is when you compensate for chromatic dispersion, it creates noise, in particular phase noise, inside the optical engine. So what we do with Nyquist subcarriers, uh, and in the case of I6, we chop the uh, wavelength uh, into eight subcarriers, uh, each running set a 12 gigaboard in this case to give us the full 96 gigaboard. And what that does is it really uh, decreases the amount of chromatic dispersion compensation we need to do, uh, and that helps is another factor that helps to reduce the noise inside the optical engine. So uh, bottom line, uh, Nyquist subcarriers, uh, the main benefit we get uh, with, with I6 is it reduces the effect of chromatic dispersion, and that reduces the noise inside the optical engine from uh, compensating for chromatic dispersion. OK, I'm now going to try and explain probabilistic constellation shaping in, in, in three slides. So uh, hopefully I'll, I'll do a good job. If, if not, there's an there's a infinite error white paper that explains it in quite a bit of detail. So with conventional uh, modulation, I'm showing 16 QAM here. Uh, you, you have, uh, and here you can see 16 uh, constellation points, and they're defined by both the phase and the amplitude. So the further out you are from the center, the higher the amplitude. Uh, if you remember from your uh, uh, high school physics or maybe university physics, uh, the the power is a function of the square of the amplitude. So the, the, the further out constellation points, uh, have higher power. 
So the pro with uh, traditional modulation, the problem is we send all of those constellation points uh, with the same probability. So there's higher outer, higher power outer constellation points get sent the same amount of times uh, as the inner uh, lower power constellation points. So all our power it, it, uh, for the wavelength is being used for those outer uh, outer constellation points. And I explain why that's a, a problem uh, in, in, a, in a couple of slides time. With probabilistic constellation shaping, what we're doing is we're sending those lower power uh, constellation points, uh, the, the inner ones more frequently and the high power ones less frequently. So now the power isn't uh, all going into those outer constellation points. Uh, and as I said, there's a, there's a white paper that explains probabilistic constellation shaping in quite a bit of detail if, if I, if I uh, leave some questions. Okay, so what are the benefits of probabilistic constellation shaping? Well, the first benefit is you get much better granularity. So with traditional modulation, you have these steps. So you have a step from 64 quam to 32 quam to 16 quam to 8 quam to QPSK. <coughs> With probabilistic constellation shaping, we can have a very smooth curve. Uh, and what we can do is we can just dial up or down the, the, uh, the, the probabilities uh, to, to give us the exact number of uh, uh, bits per symbol uh, that we want. Uh, now, in reality, when we're doing the data rate, we'd probably do that in, in 25 gig or 50 gig increments. We wouldn't necessarily want to have a wavelength that's uh, 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 you know, 473.6 uh, gigabits per second. Uh, but the other thing that we get from that uh, granularity, that ability to set the number of bits per symbol very, very, very accurately, is we can now choose the best board rate that we want and then set the, uh, set the number of bits per symbol with probabilistic constellation shaping to give us the desired data rate. So we, we have that flexibility now, uh, and that can be very useful to be able to use uh, uh, the best board rate. The second thing that we get with uh, probabilistic constellation shaping is uh, improved noise tolerance, improved OSNR tolerance. Uh, so if we compare 16 quam uh, with eight bits per symbol with uh, PCS 64 quam and the same number of bits per symbol and at the same power, uh, at the same power um, then what you get is you get a bigger distance between the constellation points with the 64 quam. It's a little hard to see here, but you have a greater uh, Euclidean distance between these constellation points, uh, and that gives you better better noise tolerance. Because as we mentioned, the further apart the uh, uh, the the constellation points are, the easier it is to detect them correctly in the presence of noise. So what that does, in addition to giving us a very smooth curve is it lifts that curve up uh, and in terms of spectral efficiency takes us closer to the Shannon limit. So uh, greater Euclidean distance equals better noise performance, better noise tolerance, uh, and that gives us better capacity reach. And then with I6, we've built in some uh, differentiators for our probabilistic constellation shaping. Uh, one differentiator is what we call long code word probabilistic, probabilistic constellation shaping. Uh, so with probabilistic constellation shaping, you have something called a distribution matcher, uh, and that takes uh, the the stream of ones and zeros, uh, and uh, it converts it to symbols with the desired distribution. And it turns out the longer that code word is, the, the larger the amount of ones and zeros that you look at, uh, the better mathematically your chances of being able to get the exact desired uh, uh, distribution of symbols. Uh, so that uh, with a long code word, we're able to get almost all the theoretical gain of, uh, of probabilistic constellation shaping, as opposed to if you use a short code word, you maybe get half the gain. Uh, another feature uh, which we call uh, DBA or dynamic bandwidth allocation combines the Nyquist subcarriers and the PCS. And what that lets us do is put um, uh, a specific data rate on each Nyquist subcarrier. So each Nyquist subcarrier uh, no, now no longer has to be the same data rate. We can use PCS to increase the data rate on the inner subcarriers, uh, which are typically uh, subject to less penalties, uh, and decrease the data rate on the outer subcarriers, um, um, which typically have higher penalties, things like 
filter narrowing uh, uh, and, and the uh, uh, and other factors. Um, so that that increases the capacity. That's another way to increase the capacity reach. And then another differentiator is related to the distribution of the symbols. Uh, and normally we'd use a get what's called a Gaussian distribution. Uh, and for terrestrial uh, networks, uh, that 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 would give you the best performance. Uh, but what you what, what happens is uh, is in some long C scenarios, such as uncompensated large effective area fibers, you want to run it. You run at a much higher um, power level, <coughs> and this can cause a, a problem with uh, nonlinearity. So what a super Gaussian does is it means there's less variation in kind of layman's terms, which is what I understand. There's, there's less variation in the power levels between the symbols. Uh, so you get less uh, cross-phase modulation and cell-phase modulation. Uh, you get slightly worse noise tolerance, uh, but it, it's only slightly worse noise tolerance. But at those higher levels, uh, it, uh, higher power levels, super Gaussian uh, will give you better performance than Gaussian. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up on these uh, on these three factors for uh, for the performance, um, you, I just wanted to explain that you get slightly different uh, uh, relative uh, value from each of these at different data rates. So at 800 gig, uh, you really need everything to be uh, to be whirring. Um, so you need the highest possible data rate because that uh, reduces your number of bits per symbol with uh, leveraging the probabilistic constellation shaping. You need to really minimize the amount of noise inside the optical engine because you're just so sensitive to any noise at these very high data rates. Uh, and you also need the, um, the you know, all the, all the features like Nyquist subcarriers and, and probabilistic constellation shaping. <laughs> at lower data rates, the, the ultra high board rates is, is still important as we explained. You still get uh, a big benefit in terms of capacity reach with a high data rate. Uh, but as we saw, uh, by increasing the data rate, so the, sorry, the board rate by 15%, at uh, 400 gig, you get maybe a 20% reach gain as opposed to a 300% reach gain uh, uh, at 800 gig. So it's slightly less important, at least a, a small increase in the, uh, in the board rate isn't going to give you as much at the lower data rates as it does at the very high data rates. And likewise, the, the modem SNR uh, is a little less important at the lower uh, at the lower uh, data rates, where, um, where where you're a little less sensitive to to noise. So you you you're really more governed by the noise that's coming from the fiber. Okay, so uh, we've talked about the factors that uh, drive the performance. Now let's talk about what actual performance uh, uh, you, you can expect to get from I6 in your network. Uh, now, before I go into that, uh, this is my disclaimer side, uh, because uh, um, you know, as, as a marketing guy, I always kind of say, well, you, this is the performance you, you're going to get uh, from a mark from a kind of um, from a, a kind of marketing figure perspective, uh, uh, and you know, you're not always going to get that that figure. You may not always get 900 kilometers of 800 gig or, or even 800 kilometers. And it really boils down to a lot of factors. It boils down to how much margin you want, the fiber types, the fiber quality, the span length, the channel spacing, how lightly or heavily loaded the network is, <coughs> uh, the types of amplifiers, whether it's just EDFA or EDFA Raman, uh, the types of rodum, uh, broadcast and select, route and select, the number of degrees, the type of uh, uh, ad drop, uh, what the Rodum uh, ILA mix is, whether you've got a high or low Rodum cascade, and then the the particular testing scenario. Is this a lab? Is it a network demo? Is it a, a trial, a live production network? And, and how much uh, in a fiber uh, is available on the actual path? So, so, so bottom line, uh, um, the actual performance, performance will depend uh, very much on the specific uh, scenario. That said, um, you know, to, to provide a nominal capacity reach figure uh, for 800 gig, if you if you look at our collateral, um, you'll see 950 plus kilometers at, at 600 gig, 2,500 kilometers, uh, and at 400 gig, 7,500 kilometers. Uh, we've done uh, a number of press releases um, 
related to uh, demos and trials. The first one we did was with Corning over their TXF fiber for uh, showing 800 gig and 800 kilometers. Uh, then we followed that up uh, with even better performance in, act in an actual live network in North America uh, with D.652 fiber um, uh, with, with 950 kilometers. Uh, then we did a, a trial uh, with uh, with G.652 fiber again, but with production levels of, uh, of margin uh, with Windstream uh, showing 730 kilometers for 800 gig uh, and uh, looping that back to get 1460 kilometers for uh, 600 gig. Uh, and then with Verizon, uh, and this was particularly impressive because it was with leaf and leaf uh, fiber, uh, G.655 leaf fiber with the low chromatic dispersion uh, actually uh, creates some significant challenges for coherence uh, uh, because you don't have the chromatic dispersion there to prevent uh, cross-phase modulation. Uh, so even, even with G.655 leaf, we were able to uh, get 667 kilometers at 800 gig, uh, 2,283 kilometers at, at 600 gig, uh, and over 4,000 kilometers at 400 gig. And then at OSC uh, back in June um, last month, uh, we, we, we presented a paper uh, uh, with uh, actually showing that we'd improved the uh, I6 performance uh, over Corning TXF fiber. Uh, we now doubled that to 1600 kilometers. So this is the uh, OSC paper. If you, have, if you uh, uh, attended OSC, you should have access to this paper. Um, and what's interesting about this is it was 1,600 kilometers. Uh, uh, it was over the, the TXF fiber, uh, which has a, a large effective area, but it also has a high chromatic dispersion, uh, and it has very low attenuation. Um, uh, and it was it with EDFA Raman's. It was 16 spans of 100 kilometers, uh, and we had two wavelengths. We fully loaded the C-band with uh, ASC noise, uh, and um, even with 1,600 kilometers, we had 2 dB of margin. So you could, you could have maybe got an extra 60%, which I think would take you somewhere in the kind of 2,500 kilometer uh, plus range if you if you wanted to run it down to zero dB margin. So so uh, you know a very impressive result, uh, really showing that uh, the potential for 800 gig in, in some long haul scenarios. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, road on cascade, and I mentioned this was uh, uh, an important uh, metric, particularly for metro regional networks. Uh, what you'll see here is that um, uh, a 400 gig pluggable running OFAG in a 100 gigahertz channel, you may be going to get uh, five spans. <coughs> Whereas with I6 uh, at 400 gig in a 100 gigahertz channel, uh, you can go well in excess of 20 rodum uh, spans, so that would be 22, 22, 23 rodums, uh, which would cover uh, any uh, eventuality um, that we've seen for, for metro rodum regional cascades. Uh, so, so the benefit for that is uh, you'd avoid ever having to use regens. It's operationally simple. Uh, you can have one optical engine that covers all the requirements, and it's also spectrally efficient. Uh, because you're running the uh, wavelength at 400 gig, whereas if you wanted to uh, send a pluggable over those distances, uh, you would have to uh, reduce the data rate to uh, 300 gig, 200 gig, or even 100 gig. Uh, so, so those are some of the benefits uh, uh, of that Rodum cascadability. Uh, then in terms of uh, spectral efficiency, uh, fiber capacity, um, we're using the same features that I talked about previously, plus some additional features uh, like the tight roll-off, uh, a shared wave locker, uh, and uh, C plus L band uh, to increase the spectral efficiency and fiber capacity. And so we can get to about 8.33 bits per second per hertz uh, in a point-to-point -point scenario, uh, over 100 gigahertz uh, grid rodum, uh, eight, 8 bits per second per hertz. Uh, and then if you put C plus L together, you're looking at 80 plus terabits. Uh, just to give you an example uh, uh, with the, um, uh, of the spectral efficiency and, and wavelength capacity reach in a subsea scenario, uh, we did a trial with, uh, on the MARIA cable, uh, 
um, between uh, uh, the US and, uh, uh, and, and Spain. Uh, and we were able to achieve 30 terabits on that fiber uh, and 600 gig wavelengths in terms of a, a hero uh, record. Uh, and then in terms of with the pluable margin, uh, that was 28 terabits uh, and 650 gig. Uh, and this compares to 20, 24 terabits uh, on, on previous uh, uh, records. Uh, and then finally, just to wrap up on the performance, um, you know, some other I6 performance metrics, uh, uh, very good uh, lightning tolerance, uh, 400 gig were in excess of 4 million rads per second. Uh, you've got high transmit power uh, with the, uh, with the uh, semiconductor optical amplifiers and the micro amplifiers at plus 9 dBm, uh, which is, is, is very helpful for uh, being compatible with some long haul rodents. Uh, low out of band noise, which means you can do colorless and filterless add drop. And then there's a lot of modes um, that, uh, uh, that enable you to optimize different parts of the spectrum for subsea. So, just to wrap up, performance is not just about wavelength capacity reach, there's a lot of other factors. Uh, the CMOS technology and the photonics are enabling the evolution. Uh, of coherent uh, and embedded optical engines like I6 are really maximizing uh, for performance with the most advanced optical features. Uh, and then uh, in terms of 800 gig performance, uh, it's about the board rates, uh, the modem SNR and the innovative features uh, with some additional capabilities uh, for maximum spectral efficiency uh, and board rate modulation flexibility for uh, really helps you with subsidy. And at that point, I'll hand back to uh, to Stephen for the Q and A. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we are indeed at the Q and A portion of the proceedings, uh, as you probably recall. In order to ask a question, all you need to do is click in the Q and A submission window, type in your question, and hit the send button to uh, to join the queue. And uh, I see several of you have done this already. Let's start with a, a question from an audience member who wants to know if you'll comment a bit about market adoption of 800G and uh, perhaps for my own purposes. Um, could you comment as well in terms of uh, how many of your customers are, are using 800G right away versus you know deploying it now for 400G and 600G with a roadmap to 800G? Um, so, so the so the question is, are they when they take an, an I6 optical engine, are they running it at 800 gig, or they're running it at low, low, lower data rates? Is that is that the question, or is the question, do people want I6 800 gig generation coherent technology? Um, uh, so let's say let's say both. We'll start with the last okay. one first. Uh, so what uh, what are you seeing as yeah, far as so uh, we're seeing a huge amount of we're seeing a huge amount of demand. Uh, 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 it, it's it's uh, uh, it's it's actually quite incredible. So there's a huge amount of demand, um, and, and basically, um, you know, as soon as we can manufacture, as soon as we manufacture them, we we can sell them. Uh, we're we're kind of supply constrained at the moment rather than demand constrained. Uh, so a, lo a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, trials, uh, orders, um, uh, a huge amount of interest. Uh, so a lot of uh, a lot of people are clamoring for this technology. Uh, in terms of what data rates they're going to run at, that really depends on the application. As I, as I mentioned, it depends on the on, on the uh, fiber scenario. Um, what we're probably seeing more demand for I6 is probably long haul and subsea, uh, uh, and there you're not necessarily going to run at the full 800 gig. You're going to be running at lower data rates, and the benefit is capacity reach. Uh, let's see again if you've got a question. Now's the time to ask it. Just uh, type your question in the Q&A submission window and hit the send button. Uh, here's another question from an audience member who wants to know if the i6 is available. Uh, we announced in May that uh, we were, we'd, we'd uh, begun shipping uh, i6 uh, uh, commercially. So uh, we've, been, we've, been, we've been shipping now for almost three months. Uh, so. Yes, it is available commercially and it's shipping to, to, to customers. Very good. Uh, here's a question from an audience member who wants to know, um, you know, when you're using 
uh, probabilistic constellation shaping. Uh, how does that affect the peak to average power ratio? How does that affect the peak to average power ratio? Um, yeah, so when you're using probabilistic constellation shaping, um, uh, you you reduce the uh, yeah. So if you you reduce the for the same spectral efficiency, um, you can you can you can use a uh, um, uh, lower power um, uh, for the set, uh, for the set and get the same noise tolerance. Um, in terms of the variation uh, between between of the power between the symbols, that depends a little bit on the um, on, on the distribution that you use. So as I explained. Uh, one of the benefits from super Gaussian, from super Gaussian versus regular Gaussian, is that uh, uh, it, that's really um, uh, optimizing a little bit more to get less variation in the power between one symbol and the next. Uh, so that helps you a little bit with non-linearities non at the expense of having a little bit worse uh, noise tolerance. Uh, but that makes sense in scenarios where you're running the wavelength at a high power. Very good. Uh, here's another question from an audience member. You were talking at one point uh, about the potential to use some of the uh, the horsepower in the uh, optical engine for uh, performance monitoring purposes. Someone in the audience wants to know what kind of system performance information can you get via the, the i6 and how do your customers intend to use it? Uh, there's a long list. Of, there's hundreds of parameters that you can get from i6. I don't know if I know all of them off the top of my head. <laughs> um, but there's a. There's well, we a, don't. Have, um, we don't have time for hundreds. But uh, yeah, the, yeah. So there's a, there's there's um, there's lots of uh, uh, parameters. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of some specific ones at the moment that would be that, that would be interesting. But uh, none are, none are coming to mind. Uh, uh, but there are a lot of parameters. Uh, and uh, uh, we make those available via uh, streaming telemetry uh, on the Groove um, GX uh, G42 platform uh, so via, via things like G GPRC. Uh, here's someone with a question about the, uh, the demonstration on the Maria cable system. Do you know off the top of your head how many repeaters were in the I, link? I don't. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I, I, don't I, was, know. I was briefed on this, and I think somebody told me how many repeaters there were, and I can't remember off the top of my head either. Uh, we'll uh, we'll look that up and uh, and perhaps get back to uh, to that audience member. Um, and then uh, I guess fine. We have time for maybe one more question. Uh, someone in the audience would like to know um, when you're extending uh, operation across the L band. Uh, is there any reduction in uh, in performance that uh, that an operator should consider or be aware of? Um, um, yeah, I think you do get a little bit worse performance in the L band than, than the C band. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head exactly how big that difference is. Uh, um, that's, that's something I have to get back on. But, it, but it, it, you don't get quite as good for, from memory. There are a couple of things that, that, that happen, um, and you don't get it quite as much out of the L band as the C band, uh, which, particularly when you're running C plus L. So, so you do take a little bit of a little bit of a hit in the in the L band. Um, but but uh, uh, I don't know the details of that off the top of my head. Very good. Uh, and uh, with that, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our program today. If we didn't get uh, a chance to answer your question just now, and I know there were several we didn't uh, we didn't have time to get to, uh, or perhaps you want to ask one offline. Maybe you're watching this on demand. Uh, you can reach Paul at the email address that you should see here on your screen. Meanwhile, you might want to take advantage of this final opportunity to download today's slides as well as the white papers that uh, Paul mentioned. Uh, as uh, I believe we said, there are two of them in. Uh, the event resources tab at the moment. Uh, Paul mentioned several other white papers. Uh, if you hang on until the uh, the end of this event, we'll actually direct you to Infineer's white paper library, and you'll be able to find some of those other ones. Uh, meanwhile, um, as I mentioned at the start of the event, the session will be archived for future access, which should take place in about 24 hours or so. And we'll again email you uh, a link 
that will bring you directly to uh, to the archive that you should feel free to share with uh, your coworkers. And also, you'll be able to find the archive version on the LightWave website, www.lightwaveonline.com, in the webcast section. Now, if you're looking for a certificate of attendance, please hang on until you see the thank you screen right at the end. Your certificate will be emailed to you automatically. Finally, I'd like to thank Paul for sharing his expertise in Finera for their help in making today's event possible, and of course, you and our audience for attending. Hope you'll join us for our next LightWave webcast, which will take place next month. In fact, we have several in August that uh, we'll be telling you about very soon. Until then, goodbye and have a great rest of your week.